Well, I don't know about you, but for me, it's been a pretty crazy week. It's been a pretty crazy month. It's been a pretty crazy year. Can 2020 get any worse? Uh, 2020 just seems to be one of those years where we're going to look back and say, wow, I can't believe I survived that year. I can't believe uh, I lived through times like we're experiencing in 2020. Um, it's just amazing to, to see, you know, what is going on in our world and the news. Um, for me, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm at home during the days uh, with my kids. Uh, my wife is a social worker at, at a healthcare uh, clinic here in South San Francisco, so she's still uh, seen as essential and she's going into work. So I'm doing the daddy daycare thing, and uh, you can see my hair turning gray uh, from all that. Uh, no, it was already that way before. Um, I'll, not sure how that happened, but uh, we're just living in this this turbulent time right now. Every time we turn on the news, we see just all kinds of heartache. We see people who are uh, getting infected with this coronavirus, uh, people that are getting sick, uh, just people that uh, are, are not making it through the coronavirus, and and we, we see the death toll keep rising on this thing. We we turn on whatever news network you like to watch or whatever uh, social media feed you like to, to get your information from, and you just see the death toll uh, rise and rise. You see uh, so many people broken because they're losing jobs, uh, they're, they're out of work. You see people uh, just struggling to, to, to make it. And it's just really saddening. It's hard to uh, experience all this. And it, you just wonder to yourself, what is going on? And a lot of times, whenever we ask questions like that, we also begin to ask another question. We begin to ask the question, where is God? Where is God in all this? Where is God when the coronavirus started to uh, spread in China and then to the rest of the world? Where was God when the death toll in Italy climbed high uh, and, and made international coverage? Where was God when New York City saw its ambulances and emergency services uh, soar to higher points than it got uh, during 9-11? Where was God when the whole Bay Area here, in the San Francisco Bay Area, got shut down? Where is God in all of this? What is he doing? Is he on vacation? Is he uh, taking a break? Is he just kind of, um, kind of winding up the the um, the machine and and letting it go and just sitting back and watching us? What is going on? Where is God? A lot of times when we go through stress or when we go through circumstances that we don't understand, we begin to ask that question: Where is God? And so this morning, that's going to be the question that guides my sermon. It's going to guide what we read in the scriptures this morning, and it's going to guide the way we think, at least for a little bit. Where is God? And so this morning, we're going to turn to uh, one of the most mysterious books in the Old Testament. It's the book of Job. And if you've ever read Job before, uh, a lot of it might sound confusing uh, the first time you read through it. Uh, a lot of it uh, doesn't make sense. Many people f just kind of flip through that book and, and, and they might read the beginning, they might read the end. But Job is one of those books that uh, just seems like a great mystery. But in reality, the book of Job is one of the greatest literary treasures we have in this world. The book of Job shares a story about uh, people who are responding to a crisis, who are responding to a dire situation in a man's life, and they ask that very question, where is God? What is he doing? What is he up to? Where's the justice in this? Where is the righteous God who promises good things to those who believe in him? As Christians right now and living in 2020, we might be asking those questions. God, why is this happening to me? Why did I lose my job? Why are my finances struggling right now? Why is my friend sick with the coronavirus? Why is my family member sick? Why have I lost a loved one to this virus that is plaguing our world right now? God, where are you? God, what have you done to, uh, to leave this world like this? What is going on? And so the book of Job, we see a very similar situation. We see a situation of somebody who's going through these exact same types of crises, and he's asking these, these same kind of questions. 
The book of Job, I'm not going to actually read uh, you know, the, the book in order this morning because it, it's a long book, but I'm going to do a lot of paraphrasing this morning, and I'm going to read a few, a few key passages. But the book of Job is, is like a Hebrew play. It plays out with different acts, and it, you could just imagine yourself going to a theater and sitting down and watching some kind of musical or some kind of play where actors come out and give these long, elaborate monologues. And so it begins uh, in heaven. It begins in the throne room of God, and uh, it, you know, Satan comes, and he's been lurking around the world. He's been going and causing mischief and trouble, and finally he comes up to the throne of God, and God asks Satan, what are you up to? What, are you, what have you been doing? What are you doing now? What, what have you, who have you been messing with this time? And Satan's just all sly and says, you know, God, I'm just kind of going here and there and to and fro and just seeing what I can dabble with, see what I can mess with. I like messing things up. And so uh, Satan is just letting God know that he's up to no good, basically. And then God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? He's a man who is upright. He is a man who fears me. He is a man who has done uh, many good things and has been very successful with his life. And so Satan begins to tell God, well, you know, God, the only reason he is so successful, the only reason he is so righteous is because, uh, because you have blessed him and he feels like you have blessed him. And, you know, if you took all that away from him, he wouldn't serve you anymore. If you took all his riches away, all the property that he owns, if you come into his life and you bring a crisis into his life right now, he wouldn't serve you any longer. And so God's like, okay, try me. And so he gives Satan a temporary dominion over this man's life. He says, you can do whatever you want, but you can't touch him. You can't hurt him. You can't strike him. And so what does Satan do? He uh, takes that and opportunity and he runs with it. And so Satan goes and he begins to wreak havoc on this man's life. Job, this man who was of upstanding character, this man who was seen as a, a wealthy person, uh, you, you, that first chapter just really elaborates on how wealthy he was, how many heads of oxen he owned, how many uh, herds of cattle, how much land he owned. And uh, it talks about his children, how he has 10 children um, that are, aren't really up to good, you know, most of the time. They, they go off and they party. And so Job even atones for their sins before God. And so Satan comes into this man's life and begins to wreak havoc. He brings a crisis into Job's life. He begins by uh, taking away everything that Job has, his riches, his livestock. Uh, he, he begins to bring a plague to his, his cattle, his livestock, so they all begin to die. He brings uh, this natural disaster to this house where his kids are partying, and all his children are destroyed, are all killed in one night. And so Job begins to live a life of torment. He begins to see all these things unraveling around him, but he still serves God. He still praises God. He still gives God glory. He still serves him. And so the rest of the book, the whole book is the series of people coming up to Job and questioning him about his life and saying, Job, where was God whenever your kids were killed? Where was God when your livestock died? Even his own wife begins to question him. His own wife comes up and says, you know, wait, where was God when all this stuff was going on? Surely something is wrong. Surely we're not doing something right. Job has these three friends, and these friends come into his life, and they sit down with him, and they start trying to think through and pick apart Job's life to see where things have gone wrong, because surely he must have done something wrong to deserve all the havoc that has been wreaked on his life. Surely he must have sinned, and maybe he's hiding a secret sin uh, that no one else knows that he's committed, and that's the reason that God has done this. And Job assures him, hey, no, this isn't the case. And so this book goes on and on. You hear all these different monologues from different characters. And like I said, even Job's own wife uh, comes up to him and says, you know, you need, to, you need to turn from God. You need to detest God for, because of what he's done to us, what he's done to our family. And so Job begins to see this whole thing just unravel around him. Many times we ask those same questions. 
whenever we face hardships in life. Maybe some of you who are watching this morning, maybe you have been directly impacted by COVID-19, this virus that is um, going around that has caused the whole world to shut down and panic. Um, life as we know it is changing rapidly. We found out this week that all the schools in California uh, will most likely not be reopening this academic school year. For my wife and I, that's devastating because my, my daughter, uh, who's in kindergarten, she's going to be missing out on the end of her kindergarten year. She's missing out on seeing her friends, uh, our, our five-year-old, you know, just keeping her cooped up in a house for so long uh, is a very dangerous thing, especially when we have a two-year-old who's right behind her. And so uh, for, for us, it's, it's, it's not just being cooped up in our home, but just seeing the things that our kids are missing out on right now. But for some people who are watching, uh, the situation goes way further than that. Maybe some of you have lost your jobs, or maybe your loved ones have lost their jobs, and now there's no financial security in your home. You're maybe wondering, okay, where's my next uh, paycheck going to come from? Where's, uh, where, where's the money going to come from whenever uh, you know, my credit card's maxed out or whether, whenever my, my savings account is drained? Some of you are really worried right now. Some of you are anxious about what is going on. You know, there seems to be no end in sight at the moment for this whole shelter in place thing. A lot of us are being asked to stay at home, to not go out. And when we do go out, uh, only go out for essential things. You know, we, we, we go to the grocery store and we see these long lines just to get in. People wearing masks on their faces. We see um, just all this chaos going on in this world right now. Every time we turn on the news, we see um, the, the death toll uh, just creep up and, and, and rise higher and higher. In some places, you know, we see that the death toll double every day. And so it, it, it's a little disheartening to live in this world right now and to not ask that question, where is God? Where is God? Should, you, we, should we begin to turn from God? Because all this is happening, surely if God created this world, if God loves humanity so much, then why is he allowing this to happen? Why is he allowing these things to happen to our loved ones or to us whenever we're experiencing all this, this turmoil and this heartache? And so this morning, as we continue to read through Job's story, as we continue to look at uh, his life and what happened in his life, just remember, there are crises that have happened in this world before. There are people like Job who have experienced deep turmoil, deep anguish, and they have asked those very same questions. But in Job's situation, he actually gets some type of answer. Because in Job chapter 38, God finally gets to speak for himself. God finally gets to answer some of the questions that Job has. Job has been rebuking his friends for um, many, many uh, chapters within his book. And finally, Job kind of turns to God and says, okay, God, what's going on? You know, well, I have served you faithfully. I have done um, everything that I can to be a, a righteous man. I have done all these things to be of upstanding character. And God, what is going on? Why am I experiencing these things? Some of you might even be asking that question this morning. God, why am I experiencing this? Why did I lose my job? Why did my husband lose his job? Why did my friend lose their job? Why did my, my, my friend get infected with this virus? Why did my family member um, contract this virus? Why did somebody that I know pass away because of this virus? We ask these questions, and we sometimes don't get all the answers. But Job finally gets to hear something from God. And to me, this is one of the most powerful, powerful monologues that God has in the entire Bible. And I'm actually going to read uh, through Job chapter 38 and 39. I normally won't read that much text in a sermon, but um, nobody's in here with me right now in the room. Uh, I'm talking to a camera, but I want to read this and I want you to uh, just really see God speaking through this. Job has asked these questions, God, where have you been? And here comes God with this incredible monologue. So if you have your Bible, if you have your iPhone, if you have your tablet, your computer, whatever you're watching this on, turn with me and read these words with me. Job chapter 38. Here's what God says. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, 
Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or stretched the line upon it. On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors? When it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no farther, and here shall your your proud ways be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth? and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. For the wicked, their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth, Declare, if you know all this, where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory and that you may discern the paths to its home? You know, for you were born then and the number of your days is great. Have you entered the storehouses of snow or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed, or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain, and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no man is, on the desert in which there is no man, to satisfy the waste and desolate land, and to make the ground sprout with grass? Has the rain a father who has begotten the drops of dew, From whose womb did the ice come forth? And who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades, or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season, or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can tilt the water skins of the earths when the dust runs into a mass and the clouds stick fast together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion, or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens, or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey, when its young ones cry to God for help, and wander about for lack of food? Chapter 39. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth, when they crouch, bring forth their offspring, and are delivered of their young? Their young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go out, and they do not return to them. Who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey to whom I have given the arid plain for his home and the salt land for its dwelling place? He scorns the tumult of the city, He hears not the shouts of the driver. He ranges the mountains as his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will he spend the night at your manger? Can you bind him in the furrow with ropes, or will he harrow in the valleys after you? Will you depend on him because his strength is great? And will you leave to him your labor? Do you have faith in him that he will return to you? You, your grain, and gather it to you for threshing floor? 
The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are they the pinions and plumage of love? For she leaves her eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that the wild beast may trample them. She deals cruelly with her young, as if they were not hers, though her labor may be in vain, yet she has no fear, because God has made her forget wisdom and given her no share in understanding. When she ruses herself to flee, she laughs at the horse and his rider. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like a locust? His majestic snorting is terrifying. He paws in the valley and exults in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Upon him rattle the quiver, the flashing spear, the javelin. With fierceness and rage, he swallows the ground. He, can, he cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha! He smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes its nest on high? On the rock he dwells and makes his home on the rocky crag in stronghold. From there he spies out the prey. His eyes behold it from afar away. His young suck up blood. Where the slain are, there is he. And so we read Job chapter 38. We read Job chapter 39. And we begin to see God's answer to Job. Basically, he's telling Job, Job, are you God or am I God? And basically he says, I'm God and you aren't. It is one of the most powerful things we hear in the entire scriptures. This voice of God, letting Job know, letting humanity know, letting us know how powerful he truly is and how much wisdom he actually has, what he actually knows. Whenever we ask those questions, where is God? What is God up to? Where was God when this tragedy happened in my life? Where was God when the coronavirus outbreak uh, took a stranglehold on our world? We ask questions like that, but we have to remember Job chapter 38 and 39. God is where he has always been. Yes, he is with us. Yes, he loves us. Yes, he created us, but he is God and we are not. And so we cannot judge God. We cannot um, put our justice system up to the tests of God's justice system because he is in a different realm. He is in a, on a completely different plane than we are. He is God, and we are not. And we have no place to question his authority. We have no place to question who he truly is. We just fear him, and we know who he is because he loves us, and he has done incredible things for us already. And so we look at books like Job, and we say, wow, look at how powerful God is. Who answers, um, you know, who does he answer to? I love it whenever he's giving this monologue to Job and he's saying, are you the one who tells the lightning where to go? And the lightning says back to me, okay, yes, here I am. Are you the one that keeps the rain and the snow in these, these big, large jars, these storehouses uh, for, for the time that I want the rain to go out? Are you the one that lets it rain in a desert where no other man is just so I can give that desolate place rain? You see God telling all these things to Job, and you see how powerful he truly is. And so we ask those questions. Where is God? What is he doing? What is he up to? Some of us have been praying over and over again for some kind of breakthrough, some kind of miracle to happen in our lives. And sometimes we begin to question, does God even care about me? Does God love me? Does God even listen to these prayers that I have? The answer to that is yes. He does. But God isn't always going to answer things in the way that we would like them to be answered. God isn't always going to take care of us in ways that we think that we should be taking care of. A lot of us are praying right now in the midst of this coronavirus. We're asking God to send us relief. We're praying for friends. We're praying for family. 
We're praying for those that uh, we, we look and, and see in the news who find themselves um, scattered and hurt and confused. And we go to God, we turn to him, and we ask for all these things. But God isn't like some kind of machine where we just put in a, a coin and say, okay, God, we're, we're putting in our coin. We're praying to you. Uh, you. Go ahead and give me what I want. He doesn't work that way. God does not work that way. God is on his own level. God has a plan and God knows what he is doing. For us, we have to trust in him. And so the book of Job teaches us that. We ask the question, where is God? What is he doing? Why does he allow such things? And the answer is wisdom. The answer is wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is fearing God. Fearing God and respecting him and knowing who he is and seeing that he is just. And, and because of that, we have to trust God. Where is God? We can't answer that question for sure. But what we can say is that we must put our trust in him. This morning, I am calling you to put your trust in God. You may be worried. You may be out of work right now. You may be experiencing some kind of crisis in your life. Uh, this, this whole coronavirus is, is definitely putting a crisis uh, in the lives of a lot of people, uh, especially people I know. But right now, I just want to encourage you to take a step back. Maybe you are answering or asking those questions, and you know what? That's okay. As humans, we, we ask those things. Job, a man who was righteous, asked these questions. But just know that, the, that this wisdom that God has supersedes any wisdom that we could ever have. No human brain, no human mind is going to come up with an answer to answer for what God's choices are or what God's actions are. But this morning, what we can know is that we can trust in him. We can trust in him that God is going to see us through the suffering, that he is going to make things right. Some of you may not get another job for quite some time. You might have to go into more debt just to cover your bills and expenses. And you know what? That's it's not cool. It, it, it sucks, honestly. But the reality is, God is on the throne, God is in control, and God is someone that we can trust. And I want to encourage you, put your trust in him this morning. Not be just because he allows us to suffer, not just because he allows us to experience crises like we are going through right now, but because he has a plan to see us out of all of this. And it started over 2,000 years ago. It started whenever Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day on a donkey, that Palm Sunday over 2,000 years ago, the day that we're celebrating today. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on this triumphant uh, parade. The people of Israel, they, they were longing for a time where the Messiah would come, when this king would come and bring restoration to the kingdom of Judah, bring restoration to Israel. And Jesus came humble on a donkey riding into Jerusalem to begin the march to his own death, to begin the march to the cross. And so now we come to a point where we find ourselves at the very beginning of Holy Week. And so this week you're going to see different um, Facebook posts on our page. You're going to see different emails coming from me that describe what happened on every day of this week. Uh, you got an email this morning from me, and you, see, you have seen a post from our Facebook page this morning for day one. And so I just want to encourage you to, to read these daily devotions, read these daily um, uh, little newsfeed snippets to see what Jesus was experiencing and to see what Jesus was up to on uh, the last week of his ministry, the last week of his life leading up to his death on the cross. But God sees our suffering. He sees us in agony when we are at our deepest, darkest times in our lives. He sees us when we go through pain. He sees us when we lose our jobs. He sees us when we suffer these illnesses like coronavirus. And he is to be trusted. He is to be feared and he is to be respected because his wisdom supersedes our wisdom. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to trust in him. Trust in him and know that even though we may suffer now, that he has paved a way for us to be made new and to be made complete in him. 
And so it's an encouraging thing. We read Job, uh, you, you, you read to the end of the book of Job and you get to see uh, a happy ending in that book, the end of the play, the end of the musical where Job is gifted everything that he lost and more double everything that he lost. God gives it all to him at the end of the book, but um, not just because of Job's own righteousness, but because God uh, is this God who is to be trusted and because God is showing his mercy and his love. And in the same way, God is going to restore us who believe in him. Those of us who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ will see restoration. It may not happen in our lifetime. We may suffer. We may uh, not see happy endings like Job saw, but we have hope that Jesus is on his way back and that he is going to restore humanity to himself, that he is going to redeem us and bring us back before the presence of God. And at that time, there will be no more suffering, no more tears. There will be no more crises. There'll be no more coronavirus. There'll be no more sheltering in place because our place will be with him. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for being that mighty God, that powerful creator God who put the earth in its place. The one who knows where the rain is stored. The one who tells the lightning where to go. The one who tells nature and animals and everything uh, exactly how to live and what to do. We love you because you are the God who is on the throne. You are the God who is in control. And this morning, we acknowledge how powerful you are. We acknowledge that your justice level is on a level that supersedes our own, that your wisdom level is on a level that supersedes our own. And so this morning, God, we ask for guidance. We ask for direction from you. I pray right now that you will be with everyone who is listening this morning, everyone who is suffering, those who are out of work, those who are, um, that are struggling with their health right now, those who are struggling with fear and anxiety and loneliness. There are so many things that are wrong in this world right now. But Lord, we know that you are in control, that we can trust in you to ultimately make all things right. So this morning, God, I pray that you will be with us as we leave from here. We pray that we will have your hope. We will have your encouragement. And God, that you will uh, see us through this coronavirus crisis. You will see us uh, come to a point where we're able to join together in service again physically. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we have worshiped the Lord through our singing his, of his praises. We worshiped him through the reading of his word uh, and listening to a sermon on that word. And the last way that we worship God at Grace Covenant Church every Sunday when we come together is through our giving. And so at this time, you'll see a link showing up in the comments section uh, where you can click and you can go online to give to Grace Covenant Church. Your donations go to further the ministry of our church. We have missionaries that are around the world that uh, rely on churches like ours to send support to them. We are doing local outreach here. We're doing uh, charities here where there, there are people who need groceries, people who need gas or other things. And so that money goes to do things here in South City and around the world. So I just want to encourage you to pray. Ask God what you should, should give. And I, I, I would just ask you to remain faithful to your giving. Uh, many of you have been so generous and we're so thankful for you and thankful for the gifts that you give us. And so I just want to encourage you to uh, continue to give. You can also text uh, any dollar amount to 84321, and you can give through text to give. You can also bring an offering to the church itself. Uh, the building is at 740 Del Monte Avenue. You can bring uh, cash or check and drop it in the mail slot in the front of the building. Uh, that thing is checked every night, so your money's safe. But I just want to encourage you to worship the Lord through your giving. Be generous. Uh, it's a hard time right now for a lot of us, uh, but I just want to remind you and ask you to be faithful in your giving. Don't let your giving to God dwindle during this time as well. So let's worship the Lord through giving. Uh, this week is Holy Week, so we have a lot of exciting things coming up. Even though we can't meet together, we're still going to have a good Friday service. It's going to be right here on Facebook Live. So I want to encourage you to join us uh, this Friday for our Tenebrae service. Uh, there's, there'll be information 
information uh, in the comments here on what time that service is. Uh, that way you can log in and you can uh, worship with us and see that service with us. Uh, I also want to just remind you I'm sending out an email uh, newsletter uh, all the time. You guys are getting all kinds of emails from me. Uh, I promise I'm try not trying to spam you. But if you want to be in on that email newsletter from our church, uh, you can go to this link that's showing up in our comments right now and you can click there to uh, sign up for our email newsletter. That way you can stay up to date with what's going on with our church. Uh, this morning, before we close, uh, I just want to read from the book of Numbers. It's the Aaronic blessing. It's this, uh, this blessing that Aaron gives, and I, I want to read it to you uh, just to, to encourage you this morning as we go from here, as we begin this holy week, as we begin another week of sheltering in place, another week of uh, crazy things going on in the news. I just want you to be encouraged by this blessing from Aaron and ultimately this blessing from the Lord. So I'm going to read this passage from Numbers chapter 6 for our benediction this morning. So let's read together the ironic blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go and have a wonderful week. Stay healthy, stay safe, and go and sin no more.